All right. Here we go again. <laughs> Third time's a charm, hopefully. I've just launched a third stream attempt. I ended that first stream, comma. I ended that first stream, comma. Now I've started a third one called Third Try, period. Let's see. There's just me here. Yep, there I am. Seems to be alive. Okay, well, so paste this into the Discord for Mickey, who's theoretically my moderator, but nobody's in the You know, she wasn't kidding when she said your first live stream is going to suck. You know what? Um, yeah. So, hey, Mickey is in the chat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Can you hear me? I can't tell if my audio is working. Okay, awesome. You can hear me. Great. Well, I hope that those two other folks, they are, one of them is a former student of mine, Kim Fraser, who now works as a milliner. She's awesome. And then Denise Wallace Spriggs, who is the woman to whom I was apprenticed as a milliner. Um, so I really appreciate that they showed up. I hope they just reload the channel and maybe find us. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I guess I'm just going to start working. And um, thank God my cat went away. I mean, no offense to him, but like he really did not need to be right up in the middle of all this. But of course, that's what cats do. <laughs> um, I'm going to just start working on a hat 
and hopefully more people will show up. Um, I'm not able to make this chat bigger, so I have to get up here and squint at it. Um, so let me see how many participants are in here. I think there's just, I think there's just you and me, Mickey. Yes, there's just you and me. Well, okay, I'm just going to start uh, working on hats. And if anyone else shows up, great, awesome. So the hat that I'm working on today is this really exciting sort of Tim Burton looking uh, hat that I'm making for a charity auction that is, um, no, no, this is not the charity auction hat. This is actually a hat that I'm entering in an art, a virtual art exhibit um, that's being held by the classical station, WCPE 89.7. That's a local classical station here in North Carolina. And um, they are having an online um, art exhibition coming this winter. And I follow them on Twitter. And they said they would love to have a submission of a hat. So I am making a hat to submit to that. And this is that hat. So it's made from straw braid. If you look, I guess you can tell best with this cap. This is what sits down on the head. It'll sit like this. Um, and it's made from, from straw braid that has been spiraled here at the top into this shape. And then there's another piece of it here that I have that is this... Um, stripey black and white striped Tim Burton looking element that I'm going to attach onto this. Um, and you would think that, that the hat that I'm going to make is this, like a sun hat, and then you would be wrong because that is a hat that you can buy at Target for $5. And I am going to make a um, handmade couture millinery hat that's a little bit more stylistically adventurous, I guess. Um, and so I have this donut of striped straw. And in terms of how I'm going to orient it on this hat, you can see here where I have um, these yellow headed quilt pins marking one line along which it's going to get attached. And I need to be careful of this part right here. Because you see, when you stop, when you spiral these braids, if you change colors, then you have to end that braid and begin another one. And so on this side, it's really not pretty. This is not the side you're supposed to look at. So that is the side that I'm going to fold up. Now, I kind of envision this thing as like, a gothic pirate tricorn meets ascot. Um, so I'm going to put a pinch in that so that my um, area where those braids overlap and do that kind of widgy thing is on the bottom of this fold. So it's, it's going to be the part of the hat that you're least likely to see. Because um, that's... A element of quality that I would like to to maintain that you don't you don't see uh, a, an element that is um, less than aesthetically perfect. Uh, my first millinery teacher told me that um, that it's okay to make mistakes. That everybody makes a hat with an imperfection in it. And he always said, if you can't fix it, feature it. Um, or if you can't um, reconcile what's happening to just cover it with some element of trim. And so that's kind of what I have done with that widgy part there at the back of this hat where we have the overlapping braids. I'm just going to make it so you don't see that part. 
So what I'm doing now is I'm pinning this onto here. All right, I need to let that go. I'm really sad that Kim and Denise showed up and uh, got screwed out of hanging around. Maybe they found me now, but I can't see the participants and the chat at the same time, so it's just going to remain a mystery, I guess. Um, so, here we go. Now it's becoming more like what I envision it as being. You know, it's funny because I've, I've built this hat once already, um, and it sat around looking like it is, and I never really finished it off or wore it anywhere, and I regret that now, but I'm glad to be remaking it here for this stream and also for um, this art exhibit that it's going to be on. So if you look at this hat now, that's kind of what it's like. Let me get up here, I see things are happening in the chat. It's all, hey, Kim Fraser made it, yay! <laughs> Excellent, hi, Kim. Thanks for showing up. Let me look at the participants to make sure I'm not missing anybody else. Yes, it's Kim and Mickey, woohoo! So, Mickey, you're still a moderator, right? I think once I make you a mod, you're a mod until I take that away from you or something. Um, yay. Okay, so this is all worthwhile. If only Kim watches, then I'm fine. <laughs> so I'm working on this hat for um, an online art exhibition, and I'm sort of trying to get it to a state of, oh, I could try it on. Is this looking like I want it to? Yes, it is. All right. Um, so in theory, if you want to sort of envision what the finished vision of this hat is, we will have this, this area over here, which exists because there has to be a cap to cover your head is going to get this giant red hydrangea on it. And so that's how I, that's, that's kind of the, the finished vision of this hat where we're going. And I have also, which I, I would love some input on this. Um, I also have this fabric flower which is a handmade silk rose that I bought at uh, Schmalberg Fabric Flower, Custom Fabric Flower Factory in New York City. They're the last remaining handmade fabric fa flower factory in the country. And um, they, have, they were having a sale when I was there and I bought a whole bunch of flowers, of which this is one. And I feel like this hydrangea, as much as I love its scale and size, that it's kind of, there's like an area of sparseness here in the middle that I don't love. And so I was thinking about taking this Schmalberg rose and seating it down in there so that it becomes the focal point of this sort of flower shrub. And oh, Denise is here. Yay, hi Denise, woo, you made it. <laughs> I'm so happy that you guys uh, were able to transfer over to this. And right now I'm just streaming live on the camera through YouTube where you just stream live right now. I got to figure out what's going on with Streamlabs OBS, not being able to recognize that my camera is here anymore, but Mickey and I will figure that out at a later time. Right now I'm working on this hat for a, a um, online art exhibition. And I was just um, musing on whether adding the Schmalberg rose to this hydrangea cluster um, was an aesthetic element that I 
that I appreciate that I that I think that that adds something to it, and I do. But I think I think I don't love it being directly in the center. You know, I remember my first millinery professor, Bill Black, University of Tennessee Knoxville, wonderful man, just retired, um, and. Albeit, he taught me how to make hats totally entirely by hand and made me afraid to use a sewing machine ever. And that kind of held me back for some years. But I, I get it. You're teaching the traditional craft by hand. He always said that symmetricality was uh, the enemy of the milliner, that if you want to make a sophisticated hat, that it should be, there should be elements of asymmetry, which I, I um, really have taken that to heart in terms of uh, my own taste in hats and hats that I have control over the design. And I, but I recognize that in theater, sometimes, you know, we're making a hat for a particular character designed by a particular costume designer and that perhaps you, you want the, um, sophistic, the, the lack of sophistication, the naivete, the country bumpkin sort of, uh, appeal of a symmetrically, located hat or a hat with very symmetrical decor. I don't dig that, but most of the time I'm not making hats for myself anyway. Um, so anyway, I, I think I like this asymmetrical location of the Schmalberg Rose better. And once I turn this into a piece of decor that's going to go on here, I'm inclined to put that rose toward the top towards the front and the top. Um, yeah. So I will, let me secure this. So that Schmalberg flower has a long uh, wire sticking out of it that I'm just going to use to secure it into the hydrangea. This hydrangea is um, one that I purchased at like Michael's craft store maybe. Um, some local craft supply place, like not a fancy millinery flower dealer. Um, but I, I liked the, the fact that the petals are variegated. They're, it's not those kinds of cheesy neon soap flowers that you find in the flower aisle at like Joanne Fabrics or whatever. Um, I, I thought it had a sort of sophisticated look to it. And it, it had a giant stem that I clipped off with wire cutters. So I'm going to turn this into an ornament here in a while using, I guess I could do that right now, um, using this fantastic antique millinery grow grain that, they don't make it like this anymore, um, has um, paper between the layers. And if you come up there close so you can see this. Can you read that cool old stuff on the spool? Um, oh, things in the chat. Sorry, my eyesight is so bad. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this giant spool of millinery grow grain, um, I bought five of these one summer in New York when I was up there working at um, Parsons Mears, which is one of the Costume Industry Coalition costume shops on Broadway that's currently uh, shut down due to COVID-19. Um, I, I really uh, support the fundraising that they're doing, which I feel like I need to put this up. So I've seen so many folks with these signs all over the internet um, talking about how hard it is to want to do your job. You want to get back to work, but you don't, you can't, you can't safely. Uh, but I'm, I'm digressing. Uh, I got this spool when I was up there working at Parsons several years ago and I was in the garment district because at the time Parsons was located in the garment district. Now they're out in Long Island City. Um, 
but at the time they're 38th, I believe. So I, I mean, I went walked past all these amazing fabric stores every day, just from my subway stop to the front door of, of the building that the shop was located in. And one of the places I walked past was Mokuba Ribbon, which if I, if I was filming this as a video, I would just print a little uh, text box down here that's like Mokuba Ribbon because they are legendarily amazing couture level ribbons. And Makuba was having a second sale from the end of their season, stuff that was, you know, discontinued and you could get like a whole spool of it for, you know, ridiculously cheap. And I called the shop manager at Playmakers and was like, how much money can I spend on ribbon out of our budget for next year? And she gave me a figure. And they also, in addition to their own Mokuba ribbons in this secret ribbon storehouse, they had a bunch of antique millinery trims of which these were one of them. There were about 20 spools there and they were selling, let me see if I still have the price on it. 10 yards, number 16, color black, rayon cotton blend. But no, there's not still the price on it. But I want to say, that it was $5 a spool for 10 yards of this amazing antique millinery gray gray. Um, and I bought five spools. So I donated four of them to the workshop at UNC Chapel Hill slash Playmakers Repertory. Um, but I kept one and this is that one. And I'm going to use it to make a base for my little hydrangea thingamajiggy. You know, uh, I would chastise my grad students for referring to anything as a thingamajiggy, um, even though I totally just did it. So that's not proper uh, vocabulary. I'm about to make a piece of decor uh, from this antique millinery row grain. God, it's so beautiful. Um, and this is another thing that, that I learned first from Bill at... UT Knoxville, that um, there's nothing wrong with using these flowers that are contemporarily mass produced in factories in like China or Indonesia or wherever, where there's plastic stems with wires in them. Uh, basically, he was like, there's nothing wrong with using these. They're great. Um, they can be beautiful millinery decor. What is... Um, what is uncool is if you just leave that plastic stem hanging out there naked so that people can see that is something I could buy at Michael's for $2. Um, that you need to use some quality material like a millinery piece of millinery grow grain and create some sort of ornamental bit of fruit that covers all of that and turns it into a more sophisticated ornament to attach onto your hat. So I think I think I want to make oh, should I make them go opposite angles or angles along the same parallel direction? I think I want I think I want them to go along the same parallel direction. Oh, that was the wrong choice. Nope, it's not. It's fine. It'll be fine. Um, so I want to take and make a little ribbon divot ornament thing thingamajig. <laughs> um, so that that will then cover up this bit of plastic and also be a, a cute little extra bit of decoration. So let me, my eyesight is so bad now. Like I can't even tell you, it is so bad. Um, I can see fine up close if I don't have the glasses on, like the glasses make it worse when I'm looking at, up close and they're bifocals, but it does not matter how I turn my head. Like, you know, the eye doctor was like, oh, you just need to get used to them. And it's like, nah, dude, this is not 
this is not working for me. Um, so speaking of eye health, while I'm sitting here hand sewing this thing together, earlier this month, actually, no, it was back in August, I had laser eye surgery for glaucoma. Um, so glaucoma runs in my family. My grandfather had it. Um, and I am not really physically conscious of what it does. You know, like it, it doesn't hurt. I don't feel, I don't feel pain and I don't notice that I'm like super extra blind all of a sudden, but my eye doctor is concerned about the pressure in my eyes. And for a while we were using these uh, different prescription eye drops that were supposed to help, but I would develop allergies to every single one and that sucked. So finally he was like, you just need the next thing, the next thing that now that you can't use these eye drops anymore is to get eye surgery. And um, so this, woman who is like a super genius eye doctor shot lasers into my eyes and burned stuff off the back of my optic nerve. It was really, really, I thought it was going to be horrible. I was terrified. Um, but actually it was not so bad. So um, if any of you guys wind up being told that you need laser eye surgery for glaucoma, it's not really as bad as you would think it is. I feel like I'm probably missing stuff in the chat, um, but then I have to put on my glasses to look at the chat, but I'm gonna do it um, just to see what's happening here. Danielle, hi! <laughs> hi, Danielle. I was just blathering on about um, my glaucoma eye surgery, which was earlier, um, and it was not as horrible as I would have thought it would be. And there, I thought that there might be a, a issue with recovery time that I would be like blind for a while, uh, but that was not the case. And I'm almost done with this. I'm such a slow hand sewer. I have to admit, I am. That is one thing that I really wish I could improve upon, but have carpal tunnel in my hands and I think it's just going to be one of those cases where that ship has sailed and I'm never going to be a fast, efficient and accurate hand sewer because it's really hard for me. But everybody has to have some skill that they um, could improve upon, right? So there we go. I feel like I want uh, another one of these on the other side. Even, no, well, that would be against the hat. I want more, I want there to be more loops of ribbon in this piece of decor because right now, so here's what it looks like. And, you know, if that goes onto the hat, I can't tell if you can see it very well or not, but if that goes onto the hat, that's fine. But I. I feel like there's only one loop of this ribbon here and I want there to be three. So I'm kind of um, thinking about adding another element that's not the big wide grow grain, but that is this more narrow millinery grow grain. There's a couple more loops just to make it um, more sophisticated, more, more decor involved instead of just one little loop, like it's an AIDS ribbon or something. Um, We'll see. I kind of, mm, I'm not going to tie this off. I'm not going to clip this thread. I'm going to add what I'm going to add and then continue to sew with the same thread. So I have this cool pin cushion here that um, is well, perhaps more patriotic than I really am, but it was a gift from um, my former uh, costume director, Judy Adamson at UNC Chapel Hill, who recently retired from the position. Um, I hope she is enjoying her retirement very much. She retired just in time because her successor, Triffin Morris, who is also a very brilliant costume maker, um, is, is really uh, keeping a lot of balls in the air trying to figure out how to teach drafting and draping and tailoring and costume history uh, on these totally online platforms. I do not envy her in the least. 
Um, and I know that Judy would have hated trying to figure that out. So, um, yeah. Anyway, she made us all in the costume shop these cool um, cupcake-like pin cushions one year. Mm, I don't love that. I kind of... Ooh, okay, here we go. I'm trying to figure out these, like, supposedly artless... Ooh, that... That is my phone, which is letting me know that it is 4 p.m., which is when I had scheduled to um, end the stream, but I had such trouble starting it that I'm going to keep going for a little while um, because that was an exercise in frustration. Um, I'm going to... Yes, I'm going to do that. Here's my second little set of loops to attach on to my, aha, yeah, this is good. This was a good choice. And then this whole entire thing, wow, you know, I, I had planned to finish this hat and start this second hat that you can't see because it's over right next to the computer. Um, I thought I was gonna get so much stuff done that I was like, oh, if I finish both of those hats, then I will start working on this Ziggy Stardust block right here. Well, no, that's, um, I should have listened to Mickey when she said, it's always gonna take you like so much longer than you think it's going to for stuff that you produce on your stream because you are not focused entirely on the work at hand. You are focused on the fact that you have an audience who you need to explain this stuff to and engage with. And I knew that on a, a practical level, but, um, but yeah, I still was overly ambitious about my achievements on this stream. I especially didn't expect the technical difficulties, but you know, it is a thing. <laughs> I can't say it is what it is anymore. Now that that phrase has been applied to the pandemic death toll, like not to get grim, but geez. Okay, so I think, see, this is why I suck at hand sewing because I always, there we go, lose control of the thread. So let's see if I can show you what I've done now. So now we have several loops of ribbon up under here. And that will attach onto the hat here. And as you spin around, you'll see the ribbon. And this gives me an opportunity to put more loops of ribbon back here to cover this very plain area where we have just the cap that sits on the head. So hopefully, I have to, I have until October to 31st, I believe, I have until Halloween, I think, to finish this, which I, I should find out what the due date is on the other hats that I wanted to make on this stream, because I'm also making two hats for donation to, um, it's a local charity called the Crepe Myrtle Festival that uh, supports HIV, AIDS, research, education, and and support for those who've been diagnosed as positive, HIV positive. Um, and normally they host the Crepe Myrtle Festival, which is like a fair, you know, it's a big festival where people all come together and do things in the same space. And that's not a thing this year. So they're holding a charity auction and um, solicited donations for that charity auction. And I asked whether hats were a thing that they would want. And they said, oh yes, we definitely want that. So they asked for one winter appropriate style and one summer appropriate style. And um, so that was the second hat that I was gonna work on today, haha, -ha, was the, the summer appropriate style, which is um, I think what it's going to be is a blocked, 
parasite silver parasitesol blocked sort of top hat esque style that I'm going to put ribbons and flowers on most likely. And then the winter one that I've already finished it. This is the winter hat that I'm donating to them, which if you can see, it's got this spray of red felt poppies on it here. These, these felt poppies actually, um, I did not hand felt them. I bought them from a woman who was selling hand felted flowers at the um, public market in the streets of Edinburgh, Scotland, when I was there for graduate school a few years ago. And I bought a whole string of these guys, figuring I would use them on hats because, hi, they're super fabulous. And um, I made this hat some years ago, actually. And I used to live in these townhouses right up the street from here. And um, when I lived over there, both of my next door neighbors that were attached to my unit saw me carrying this hat in and were like, that hat is so beautiful. I love that hat. I would wear it every day if I had one. So I made them both iterations of this hat. So this is actually the third one of these hats that exists. And I'm going to donate it as the winter style to the Creighton Myrtle Festival for them to auction it off. And if you look here in the back of it, it's got my La Bricolous millinery label back there. There's gonna be another one in this silver hat, which is over here that you can't see, but you'll see it next week if you show up next week for the live stream, because I may, I may finish this one in the intervening time. I haven't decided yet whether I should work on projects that track from stream to stream. Denise, you do that. And, and I think that that provides a nice continuity to where people see something get to a certain point and then they see you pick it right back up at that point. I think that's really great. Um, but since what I'm trying to do with this stream is one of the many things I'm trying to do with this stream is uh, provide an opportunity for my graduate students to just witness me working on stuff the way that they would if we were all together in the costume shop they would see me making you know 40 hats for a playmaker show uh, and and but they wouldn't see it start to finish they might catch something at the beginning and then get caught up in their own projects and then see a second fitting or not see it again until it shows up on opening night and so I'm kind of I'm kind of torn as to uh, whether projects should track on my stream or not. I would love to hear what you guys think about that. Um, both in terms of like, as a, a viewer, like, do you want to see me pick this back up and start working on it again next week? Or do you want to see it in a finished form next week because I've had time to just work on it non-streaming? I see that there are more comments in the chat that I feel like I need to get up and look at. I have to figure out how to up the scale of the text in the chat because I really cannot see it from over there. Like I said, my eyesight sucks. Um, and I had figured it out on Streamlabs and then Streamlabs borked out on my camera. So that was not so cool. Denise ran off. Okay, great. Thanks for coming, Denise. Bet she's already gone. Oh, I'm your studio buddy. You're working on stuff too. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's great. It would be fun if we just all had like that if it if it um, if I had more milliner viewers who were streaming me while they were in their studio and it was like we're having a sort of a, a millinery sewing bee. That would be fun. Well, time wise, uh, it's only 408. I'm gonna keep working on this thing. Whatever. Um Nothing has gone as planned today, so I'm just abandoning planning. I need to tie off, knot off, and tie off my little ornament here, and then put it on the hat. Then I need to come up with some, some more types of ribbon decor to cover up the rest of this 
lozenge of, of braid, this expanse of braid that will be present on the back of the, the hat. Just that come out. All right. Recently, I did an interview with uh, a young man who's going to uh, undergraduate school at, um, I think it was Montclair State University, um, Montevallo, Mont something. Um, his professor, one of his professors is someone who worked with me at Playmaker some years ago and had been at the time our electrician and now she teaches at this school whose name I cannot remember. And um, they had a project in one of their theater classes where the students needed to um, interview somebody currently doing the professional job that they hoped to do someday. And this young man wants to be a theatrical milliner. So because of our, because one of his faculty members that is way big. I need smaller snips than that. I know I brought some over here. Um, oh, there we go. Because one of his professors used to work with me, she was like, oh, you should interview Rachel. She is a hat maker. And um, we talked about different ways that you can make a living as a specifically a milliner, not a um, more diversified costume craft person, which is what I do because at Playmakers, I don't just make the hats. I also um, alter and rebuild shoes and make masks and parasols and gloves and, you know, all kinds of things that are not sewn products made by a draper or a tailor or a dressmaker. Um, but he is specifically very interested in focusing only on hats. And so we were talking about how to, if you're an independent milliner, theatrically speaking, that um, how, how you can do that for a living. And um, I don't even remember why I started talking about Joseph, but oh, I know, I invited him to come to this stream, which he was sent his regrets because he's in class at 3 p.m. So I know for a fact he's not here, um, but I really enjoyed talking to a young person who's interested in this field um, as a profession in the future. And he had so many great questions. It was such fun to talk to him. And um, I really hope that, that he succeeds at it because, um, you know, the current big three Broadway milliners, Arnold Levine, Lynn Mackey, and Rodney Gordon, you know, they are all 10, 20, 30 years older than me. And many of the folks that run those shops not just millinery, but but the Broadway costume shops. Um, several of them are are at retirement age, where you know eventually they're going to you know drop dead at their cutting table, or need to hand off the business, or want to hand off the business to some successor. And um, this young man, I thought, you know, if you want to do it, like move to New York and just start working, be a, a workroom milliner's assistant at one of these places. Um, there's loads that you learn just from, from observing studio time like this, where like you are in the room and your job is to just sew labels into these 25 bellhop caps. But the person who runs the shop is building something like this or even crazier than this. Um, and you just get to see things happening around you that, that we're really not having right now due to how um, COVID has made us need to work in all these different geographical locations. But I, I do really love the idea of a, a shared studio stream where we can feel like we're working together even though we're not working together. So I'm done with my little ornament. Debating, what time is it? You know, I'm gonna go till 4.30. Let me set my alarm so that I'm, otherwise I'll go for forever. Um, and I feel like I need to check in with Mickey about trying to figure out what is wrong with my Streamlabs OBS, not seeing my camera. Um, but 
set my alarm. Let's say 445. Okay. Um, I'll stop then and then we'll figure it out. I really did hope everything worked out fine when I tested it this morning. And then I restarted my computer and I, uh, I updated some software. And I think that's how I worked myself on this. Um, in terms of now it can't see my camera unless I'm streaming through YouTube's studio as opposed to Streamlabs OBS. Um, but I'll figure that out at some point. Right now, what I want to do is attach my stripey Tim Burton-esque wing onto this hat. So I'm, can you see that? I can't tell if I'm showing it very well or not. Let me get up here. So you can see it against my black dress. This curved needle is what I'm going to use to sew this uh, stripy brim element onto this base cap by hand. And a curved needle is, uh, for me at least, I consider it to be an indispensable element of the milliner's toolkit in terms of um, hand equipment that you really need to have. And especially for a task like this, where I'm sewing these strange three-dimensional shapes together, you know, I'm not I'm not just sewing a running stitch of a flat piece of fabric to another flat piece of fabric, um, or even a, a, a curved seam that is sewn by machine. You know, when you're hand sewing uh, a strange angle like this, where you have one surface that is complex curvature this way, and the other surface is complex curvature at a almost right angle to it, uh, you really need to be able to go in and come back out without having to pull your thread through the other side of the material. And so these curved needles really expedite sewing strange things onto other strange things. God, you know, given how bad my eyesight is, it's unfortunate that I like to make hats from materials that are the color black because black on black is really hard for me to see so i may have to go back and double stitch this um if i don't yeah i'm getting it i'm getting it so i will tell you a secret about this hat which you know this is not one that is going to the charity auction so uh this is just kind of a fun fact that won't at all affect its future as a hat that's entered into that um, art exhibit that WCPE is hosting. This hat began its life as a crappy, oh, well, not crappy, a inexpensive summer sun hat from Target. This was a $10 hat from Target, and I saw it. And at first I thought, oh, that's kind of cute. I might wear that, but let's be real, no. Um, but I did appreciate the way that they had used um, a type of straw braid that's called raffia straw braid, where um, raffia straw is um, very resistant to um, cracking and splintering. And it is very easy to sew by hand and by machine. It's got a wonderful texture. I, I find it to be a pleasant texture. And um, it was, a, it was um, oh, I can't remember what came out that summer, the summer that I bought this. It was some, maybe it was a 
Tim Burton's Sweeney Todd. For some reason, black and white striped everything was super trendy at the time. And um, oh, have a jammed up. That's why I'm bad at hand sewing. Um, anyway, there were black and white striped tights, black and white striped dresses, black and white striped underpants. I mean, you name it. It was like stripey goth weirdness was everywhere for cheap at Target. And um, such was also this hat, an inexpensive floppy summer sun hat. And I was like, mm, I, I'm going to buy that. I will never wear it as what it is, I don't think, but I will use the materials from which it is made to create something infinitely more fabulous. And that is what I'm doing right now. Um, in my opinion, this hat is going to be way more sophisticated than the $10 sun hat that it used to be in a previous life. And that points to something that I tell my graduate students, actually, when we talk about straw braid spiral construction like this, um, that you don't have to buy um, a hank of straw braid from a millinery supplier. You can find in costume stock at work or at discount stores, local retailers, you can find hats that have been constructed of spiral braid, like the prior iteration of this hat, and harvest the braid from them. Because contemporary spiral braid hats are sewn with a machine that does a chain stitch using um, essentially fishing wire, or uh, fishing line rather, like that clear nylon fishing line. And um, all you have to be able to do to unspiral them is clip that thread in the right place and then just pull it and it'll zip the chain stitch out of it. You do have to press, it comes, you know, it's been stitched into a spiral for, you know, ever since it left the factory. So you do have to um, press it back out straight to, or whatever curvature you need it to be in to reuse it. Um, but that can be, I mean, like I said, the original hat that I bought for this was $10, I believe. And, um, you know, if I bought uh, two different hanks of braid for this, you know, that would be what, like 20 bucks a piece. So um, that is a trick that I tell my students to look for if they're interested in um, exploring spiral braid construction to look for hats from which they can harvest the braid instead of worrying about purchasing. I mean, obviously, if you're going to become a, a milliner who specializes in spiral braid construction, then high five to you and you should definitely buy the bulk stuff. But for my students where they're just making, they might might be the only hat that they make in that style in their whole career, then, you know, why would you invest a lot of money when you could invest less money uh, for a similar quality material? I need to tie off my thread because I have come to the end of my sewing thread. And let me put this up here and check my chat. Oh, nobody's talking. Great. That's okay. I don't, I don't need you to be talking. I'm just running my mouth while I'm sewing and talking. Um, maybe... Maybe I want to make more of, mm, no, I need to wait till I finish this. I'm getting ahead of myself. Multitasking has broken my brain. Um, it is so hard for me to, to actually finish something now. You know, I'll start it and then it's like a, like a magpie. It's like, oh, shiny. I go off and do something else. Um, like I don't need to, I need to not put the cart before the horse and, um, finish the hat before I finish the trim for the hat. Like now that I have my, my hydrangea slash rose spray taken care of, that's really all I need to do to start with until I get this hat completely put together and then look at how much trim I need to create for the empty space that is left once I attach the hydrangea to it, I need to not 
build that stuff in advance, but yet it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, trying to knock this off, and I totally can't see because it's black on black thread on black straw, and I need to work it out. So I have I have great lighting in this room in terms of you know for filming, but I do not have great light in terms of seeing to sew. I need to remedy that. I'm also trying to figure out how I can stream so that I can access my iron and my sewing machine as well, because sometimes I do a project where I need to have access to both of those. Um, like even right now in working on the, um, the trims, the, the ribbon elements of this piece of decor, if I had access, if I had an iron right here, I would have totally used some steam on that ribbon, but shrug, um, it's in the next room. And I, well, I guess I could, I, I have made a slide that is, oh, we're not in Streamlabs, so I couldn't put up my Be Right Back. Um, that I so lovingly crafted and is useless today but we'll figure out what's wrong and I will do it in future where I could go in the next room, use the iron, and you would not think that I had abandoned you because there was just an empty room here with hats on a table. Um, You know, I feel like I feel like I've been told that it's gross to lick your thread before you tie a knot in it and gross to lick your thread before you put it through the eye of the needle and maybe that is is um hyper concern about germ transmission or something which yes is a hyper concern right now thanks to the pandemic but um I don't know if that's bad practice it's bad practice that i have always engaged in and i would love to hear about why like i get why you aren't supposed to hold pens in your mouth because that's how you inhale them into your lungs but it seems like just licking your thread to make it more uh sleek to go through your needle is um kind of a Not prudish, but it seems kind of like a mismanners thing. Like, don't do that. That's ill breeding. Um, when really it's like, it seems like it's just expeditious, but okay. Um, regardless, I always do that. Lick my thread before I tie it in a knot or before I thread a needle. Um, and if it's bad practice, then too bad. Um, I guess I wouldn't do that if I was threading a needle. No, I would still do it if I was threading a needle for somebody else. I mean, you know, like, come on. If I have to thread your needle, then deal with it, I guess. I am now halfway done with sewing this thing to the cap. I need to come up with a word for what the black and white striped element of this is. I've been thinking of it as a wing because it it flares up. Um, it's not, this hat is not quite a tricorn. You know, there's not three pinches. There's only one pinch in this hat. And so it's not a brim really, but I guess it is sort of a variation on a brim, but it doesn't attach in time. Like it, it deviates from the crown here at the side. So this is the sort of like really anal millinery vocabulary debate that I love to, to think about and very few other people probably care. <laughs> but I feel like this is, this is not a brim. Whatever this is, it is something else. It's maybe it's a fin. I think of it as a, a, a wing or a fin are, are much better um, names for it 
as a design element, structural element to this hat, then trying to fit it into the category of brim. And it's definitely not a visor because it doesn't shade your eyes from anything. So let me know what you think. I, I'm, I'm leaning towards Finn. Wing is kind of a, a loaded term these days since hats used to have actual bird wings on them. And if you've ever come across one of those antique bird wings in like a box full of old millinery trims, they're not really as disgusting as you would think they are because they're not, at least all the ones that I have found, are not actually just chopped off taxidermized bird wings. They are um, created to look like actual bird wings from actual bird feathers. And, you know, given the time period, it's possible that birds, birds probably did die to harvest those feathers. Um, but it's, it's not like they stretched out the bird's wing and hacked it off of their body. Even so, there are lots of ethical concerns about those um, old bird wing, wing-esque feather ornaments from the 19th century. Um, and, you know, I, I forget the name of the book, but I did read about uh, a book about, I think it might have been about how Audubon and a couple of women who were um, animal rights activists at the end of the 19th century um, campaigned against uh, using taxidermized entire birds and all these elaborate bird feathers on hat styles of the time that um, that was an animal rights minded movement that was happening. And I find when I'm teaching um, millinery students nowadays that um, many of them, I had a the first time I taught millinery class at UNC Chapel Hill, I had a student, um, a young man who is now a quite successful uh, Hollywood tailor. He did uh, suits for uh, the primary cast, male cast, on American Gods most recently. So if you watched that show and you saw Ian McShane and Orlando Jones, their, at their suits, he made them. Um, but he is um, an ethical vegan. And I have all kinds of vintage um, 19th century bird trims that we look at when we're having millinery class on site in the studio. And he was just repelled by those. And I did not force him to touch them. I mean, you know, you are perfectly justified in being repelled by them. They're gross. But um, I, I find more and more that contemporary students uh, want to find alternatives to feathers and fur for millinery and, and other garment decor. And um, I'm always interested in alternatives to that. Kim, who is probably still in the chat, my eyesight's so bad I can't see, but um, Kim did a project on using millinery felt to create trims while she was taking my millinery class. And um, she did a couple of really beautiful felt sculpted feathers that um, that was a technique that I, I'm glad to have witnessed her developing it because I intend to use it myself sometimes. Um, the, the feathers are really beautiful. And, you know, if you're interested in seeing them, I think it's not on my current blog. It actually dates back to when La Bricolus was a blog hosted by LiveJournal, which that archive still exists on LiveJournal. Um, I just don't update that blog anymore because now I'm on blogspot.com. Um, but there's pictures of Kim's um, felt trim survey project 
including the fake feathers that are really outstanding. They have a sewn bit of millinery wire sewn into a channel to create the spine of the feather. And then you clip the felt in to create the flues of the feather. Um, it looks really sophisticated in a good quality millinery felt. Let's look at the chat again. Hey, Chris! What about finger wax, like for sorting papers? Oh, that's a good idea. So Chris is my partner. He's actually right downstairs underneath us in his own home office. Um, thank you for signing in, Chris. That's really sweet. Um, I really didn't expect you'd want to watch a millinery stream, but um, vertical brim is a good suggestion. I like that. Um, well, you know, okay, you say animal rights folks may still not appreciate those felt feathers because they're felt, um, which, okay, I, the, the woman, the vegan milliner who's making feather trims from layered fabrics, um, that is a style of feather making that they've used on Broadway for um, creating fake feathers for garments that literally cannot have feathers on them or they need a stylized feather look. There's a lot of feathers created that way. And um, I wanna say it was Follies designed by Greg Barnes. Um, I remember that Tricorn, uh, that's a shop in New York that does Broadway costumes, um, did a number of feathers like that. And then Triffin, who's the head of the graduate program at UNC Chapel Hill now, um, had a couple of samples of feathers that they had done that they then had to manufacture like 5,000 of them or whatever for, oh, maybe it was Bette Midler. Anyway, um, that, that vegan milliner is doing something that is a fantastic idea and it creates a beautiful um, cruelty-free feather. Um, I think that I, I, I understand why ethical vegans would have trouble with millinery felt feathers that Kim created. Uh, but at the same time, it's an animal product, but it, it, if you don't shear a sheep, have you seen any images of that sheep that like ran away from its owner in Scotland and was gone for like three years and then they found him and he has so much wool that like he looked like a, a rolled up sock. Like you need to shear sheep and then you take that wool and you card it and you turn it into fur felt um, along with some animal, other animal fur, I mean, rabbit, beaver, whatever. Um, I don't know that I would consider that a cruel process, but to each his own. Um, what am I at for time? Ooh, I still have 12 minutes till 4.45. So now I have attached my vertical brim slash fin to my hat. I'm, I'm not loving this tack through and through right here though. I kind of want this, if we're gonna look at this, I kind of want to do a swing tack up here, like not at the very edge, but in the middle, of this fin so that the shape that we get, instead of it being closed up like that, that we have a little bit of openness here. And I guess here is an aesthetic question. If I swing tack that, do I want there to, to be a, a a flower element down in there that you only see when you look into the, the crown of this hat that's maybe revealed inside of this sort of dubiously mm, vaginal-esque opening um, that, that I could have some sort of red flower that's down in here uh, that you would only see when the person wearing it turned their head and you saw inside of that swoop. But I think I want, I think I want to swing tack this. 
like that. I also kind of want to retroactively put a piece of wire on the edge of this fin, this vertical brim, so that um, I can control how it waves a little better. That might be an interesting thing to pursue. If I swing tack this, ooh, I could swing tack it up here so that I got a really, or, you know, now that I've, now that I've attached this on here, there's, there's so many possibilities for what I could do with it that, oh, that's a good one. If I, if I really tack it through and through right here, Oh no, that angle is too sharp right there. I really, I want a safety pin so that I can mimic a swing tack. Hmm. Well, or, or I can use my quilt pins and pin into this foam head so that I get something like a swing tack. There we go, yeah. That's what I wanna do. Oh yeah, that's, that, is, that is the shape that I want there. See as this comes around, so that you have an interesting complex curve to that plane. And I think if I did it like this, then I don't. I don't think I do need anything in there. Let me put it on my head. Mm, I can't. <laughs> I can't pin a quilt pin into my own cranium. But, um, but I can put it on my head. Mm. Maybe what I do is... Sorry, excuse me, I did not mean to curse there, but I just stabbed myself with a pen. And that was another thing I was told, oh, blood. That was another thing I was told in my very first millinery class uh, by Bill Black, my professor, was that you're not finished with a hat until you've bled on it. That, uh, or not necessarily on it, but until you draw blood that, that you have not finished working on it. Um, so that is good to know that I, this early in the process, I have stabbed myself. So whenever I think it's done, it's actually done. <laughs> the goal with this hat, in terms of how I see this hat acting, is that it looks extremely asymmetric, extremely asymmetrical, um, but that it actually is very stable for the wearer because uh, this cap, if it functions the way I think it will function, it will sit down on the head. Oh, there we go. It was very, yeah, it will sit very stable on the head, very balanced, especially now that I have the weight of this big um, hydrangea blossom over here. Um, this feels very stable because the base is symmetrical and close fitting to my head. But because we have all of this strangeness going on with this asymmetrical swoop of the fin, it looks like it is precariously clinging to the side of my head. Um, and that is that is what I love about this hat design is, is that it looks very... Um, unstable and un imbalanced, but it's actually extremely well balanced and you could do a kick line in this. I mean, I wouldn't, but if I were making this for a show, this person could do very elaborate choreography and they would be all fine. See, there is more stuff in the chat.
<laughs> their poops get stuck to them in a problematic way if they're not shorn. Exactly. Okay. It's like, I don't know if any of you all have ever had a um, Persian cat. My very first cat when I was a child was a Persian cat that was sterile and we adopted it from a rescue mission. And if you don't give them good haircuts, they have that same problem that sheep have. So um, speaking of, of poop on this excellent millinery stream today, um, going back to whether it's ethical to work with wool felt or not, I believe it's ethical um, because it's not ethical to have sheep with too long of wool and poops stuck in their fur, hair. So that is the uh, mark of the end. That is the alarm to let me know that it's time to end my stream. Thank you all for showing up today. I really appreciate it. Um, and bearing with me with my initial te technical difficulties, that was um, frustrating, but figured it out. I will be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Hopefully I'll have resolved my Streamlabs difficulties by then. Um, you can... Subscribe to my channel, hit the bell if you want notifications for when new content goes live on Monday and streams happen on Thursday. There is information on the about page as to where you can find me on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, my blog, if you want to read stuff instead of watch stuff. And um, that's going to be the end of the stream. I'm really kind of disappointed now that Riley only showed up to be um, a kitty on screen when the camera wasn't working. So you missed out on some cat content, but he loves to get up on this table and look out this window. So I'm kind of hoping that I will have Millinery Studio mascot one of these days to participate in my stream. Well, thank you so much, you guys. And bye-bye. See you next week. Subscribe to my channel. Check out my content. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> bye.